Welcome to our May edition of our Education Technology Leaders webcast. I'm David Couch. Uh, I'm joined by Mike Lettingham and Bob Hackworth and Chuck Austin. And we have uh, Phil Coleman and Linda Burtonoff and, and Marty Park will be joining us as well. I think this will be our last chance before the, the summer break to have a high percentage, percentage of you uh, uh, watching the webcast. And so we're going to cover a couple important topics that we feel cannot wait until next year or for you to maybe not find out about them in June and July. And that's why we're spending so much time on uh, cybersecurity and safety on this one. We have an urgent need, and there's a couple of these that are urgent, and so uh, we're going to focus in on those um, and hoping we're, we have a strategy and actually put it in motion before the beginning of the next school year. So we also have the Go Soapbox questions. You've seen those in advance. Uh, go ahead and log uh, into those. I think those are those open now for them yeah, to I'm respond open. to? And we'll be monitoring that throughout for anything that, that bubbles up. So Bob, let's talk about um, cyber safety and cybersecurity, and, and, and Chuck, you're going to join us in on this, and really all of us are here. We have a major issue that is going on around the country in K-12, mm -hmm. um, and it's really happened the past two or three months. We've always had this on the radar screen, but it has significantly jumped up in intensity, and we've seen that here in Kentucky. Um, and the cyber criminals are getting pretty uh, savvy about this. They're studying K-12's organizational structures. They're, they're who reports to who, who's in a leadership position, who's in a financial position, who's in charge of data, who's in charge of technology. And, and just one more thing to, to preface it a little bit. We're seeing that they're looking at spending patterns. They're watching what you're spending, who you're spending it on, because in our world, unlike the, the private sector, we have to have everything transparent. And we're also, in our world, we try to be very service-oriented and very helpful. And for the most part, most of us are trusting and honest uh, folks, and the cyber criminals are taking advantage of all of that. Absolutely, they, they absolutely are, David. You're 100% you're right. In, and, and we are somewhat in the middle, and, and I hate to go to hyperbole this early in the morning, but <laughs> we're in the middle of a cyber security tsunami. <coughs> uh, and and it, it, it's definitely something that, that we need to, to kind of uh, get ourselves out of, or at least increase the defenses that we have. And uh, as you know, and, and I think as everyone out, uh, out there knows, we have implemented a ton of, of technology defenses, and, and they all work really hard for us, and they've done an, an excellent job. The, the attackers who are attacking us are finding where the, the chinks in the armor are at, and whether that's in a technology that is misconfigured or not configured quite strongly enough, or whether that is a person or whatever else, uh, these folks are finding those weaknesses and exploiting them. And so uh, I think it's time for us to uh, get on the same page. And when I say us, I don't just mean the folks in this room and the folks watching us. I really mean everyone in a district, everyone at KDE, all of us together really have to start pulling in the same direction in order to make a, a, the difference that we really want to make. So, so Bob, two points. I think, um, and I, I love your hyperbole this morning. And I, I think really, um, to, I guess to build upon that, I think what we're trying to issue today is the early warning signal that there's been an event that's going to trigger a tsunami. And I say that because here's what we know. We know that things are going to get worse before they get better. All right? So there's something coming that we're all trying to head off, number one. And I think the other thing that we're starting to see the bad actors target, and I know you're going to talk about today, are some business processes. Maybe business processes that have been in place forever that people really don't think have vulnerabilities associated with them, but they do. And we've actually got real documented evidence of where things have happened that could be avoided. That's absolutely right, yeah. Chuck. And, and so that's why I say it, this isn't something that just the CIOs and the DTCs are going to fix or are going to, to help alleviate the pain from. This is something that everyone in the district really has to step up and, and start working in, in the same direction. So our intention is, while we're talking to you all, and we want you as a representative of your district technology-wise, and all the topics we're talking about, you are right now the representative, and we are counting on you to at least inform them of all these topics, is, I, you know, I met yesterday with our chief financial officer, and Bob knows this, she's willing to send something out to the finance folks, because they're definitely targeting them. Uh, you know, I've worked with the commissioner, he's willing to send out something to the superintendents, but you've got to hear it from multiple angles, multiple ways, but I think one of the best things to get people's attention is it's actually happening. We, we yes. try to do a lot of prevention, mm -hmm. But when we go, well, this actually has happened in five or six districts within the past, you know, two months uh, at different parts, different sizes of districts. 
Exactly. Um, and it's more than it's ever happened before. And just having come back from meeting with my peers across the United States, they are the same thing's happening to them. But it's happening to them actually more because they don't have a lot of structures that we have in place. Mm -hmm. But it's still happening. And, 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 the, and the cyber criminals are having such success with it. Is, and, and you know this is why you got to have all the technical things in place. And we can, we can beat those up. 90, 95% of this is taking advantage of people. And, the, and, and studying the, the, the processes that you, you, you're talking about mm -hmm. that have been quite, that actually could have been gamed and scammed long ago. Yeah. Uh, but now they're, they're really focusing yeah. in on them. And that's, that's because the, the technology is, is being effective at, at what it's supposed to do, which is protecting things. So they're, they're heading back to, towards the people. And that's something we've been saying for a while now, you know, that, that the, the people are, are the folks that, that we need to really uh, get their game a little bit better in terms of defending against this. One of the, two of the things that we've seen here recently, uh, and I'm not, not going to mention district names, but we saw a district that uh, um, uh, was... Uh, tricked out of millions of, potentially tricked out of millions of dollars. They, they could have very easily lost millions of dollars. And I'm not sure that everyone in the state understands how that happened, um, but it was a, uh, 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 a very simple um, uh, communication, really, where someone pretended to be a vendor and said, here's where you need to send this, this money now. And so when you get any sort of information from a vendor, uh, from uh, an employee, a staff person, and they say, change something, we need to be a little more suspicious of that now. But it wasn't just someone <clears throat> out of the blue, because these things are very tailored. So it's obvious someone has spent time, a cyber criminal, understanding that district, and understanding, looking at who they're paying and when they're paying them. And so it wasn't and just a pays? random. And who pays. And who pays. So they have studied them. and so. You know, we're, we all need to be on high alert. We are being studied very, very closely by these cyber criminals. You know, and you're right, the, the web pages that we have that kind of help the public and help our customers understand who to get in contact with are also helping the fishers and the attackers know who they need to attack specifically. And then they are also able to come up with such a good fake communication that it seems believable. And if you don't spend enough time to be just a little bit suspicious, you're going to kind of, I'm not going to say, well, I hate to say rubber stamp, but sometimes that's what happens, and say, yeah, this looks legitimate. It has enough of the clues that make it look real that I'm just going to uh, approve and move forward. And these are good people. Uh, these are smart people that they're, that they're scanning and targeting and trusting people, mm -hmm. but try to be service-oriented, trying to get it fast. I do think would help this uh, close to $4 million from being going overseas two things happen is one is the person that's supposed to be paid very quickly says I didn't get my money that's right and they understood the right the right timing and the other and, and when they said it the person that looked at that response didn't wait a few days they go what do you mean you didn't get your money if that takes one or two days more either way of that that money's gone that money's gone because what by the time you know they, they had sent it but it hadn't traveled overseas yet the local bank had sent it to the East Coast Bank and the East Coast Bank had not processed it yet and that's how it got stopped I mean, you, you go one or two days, and that's close to $4 million, and it's never coming back. That's right. So it's miraculous. It is. It's miraculous. It's, that's one in a million that that doesn't go across. And, and we have another good example of a horrible thing happening that I want to talk about very briefly. And then we have something that I think is impacting almost every district that I want to talk about. And then we're going to dive into some ways that we're going to hopefully help districts protect themselves and that we're going to help districts be more protected. The other item that has happened just recently is that we had a, a district that um, <coughs> uh, had a very key password that was brute force guessed, meaning that they didn't necessarily give it away, but that someone actually guessed the password. And um, I don't know how many tries it actually took, but it probably took more than 10. It probably took quite a few and that meant that that password probably did not have an account lockout threshold on it, which is something we'll get into here in a minute. But anyway, the, it wasn't your average account. It wasn't your average no. account. That account did have some extra permissions on it as well, which is something that, that we should always try not to have. Like if it's your daily driver account, if it's what you check email on, if it's what you send correspondences with, if it is what you do your web browsing with, 
it should not have elevated permissions like a system administrator, global administrator, that sort of thing. Well, that's a hassle <coughs> to log into separate systems. It's a hassle to have two different accounts, but one for making those major changes, one for doing your email. But when you see and when you really have evidence of what that can mean from a negative point of view, suddenly that extra couple of minutes over the course of a week don't seem that important. And I think the cyber criminals are recognizing there's X number of people in organizations, K-12 organizations, that are not making that separation. We find a lot of things that happen, uh, that this happened, uh, is there's not been a, a, a you know, separation of duties enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's on the financial side where we see people have, have intentionally taken money. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing has happened. You have to have the self-discipline and the discipline, even though it's a hassle, to have these accounts separate. Um, and this particular probably affects smaller districts where the people are wearing so many different hats. Mm -hmm. But the scammers, the cyber criminals, are targeting those organizations. I'd like you to talk about two more. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the, which I see happening more in my peers, the direct deposit yes. scam. Uh, and I'll talk about another mm -hmm. one I call the iTunes card scam. Got so it, go yeah. Ahead. So the, one of the issues that's happening everywhere, uh, not like these two main ones, the big ones that we just kind of briefly touched on, but I think everyone hopefully is aware that um, employees' direct deposits are, are being targeted by scammers who are sending emails to the HR departments in your districts. And here at KDE, by the way, we are not immune. And saying, hey, I'm employee uh, Joe Public, and I want you to change my direct deposit information from this bank to this new bank. And so if the district does that, then suddenly that the actual employee will not get paid for a certain amount of time until they recognize they're not being paid and then they'll go in and say, hey, why am I not being paid? And the HR department says, oh, by the way, we changed your, your direct deposit information. And that sometimes is a surprise. We've uh, seen people go for a couple of pay periods before they realize that they're not being paid and by that time, that money's gone. And the district has to somehow figure out a way to reimburse that money and that, that's gotta come from somewhere. Interestingly, the scammers have realized that they don't necessarily have to provide legitimate information that someone can verify before they agree to make that change. If they just send something that looks close enough and it just has a routing number, it doesn't have to be the accurate old bank routing number. And so that's why we have to be a little more, a lot more suspicious and implement things, implement new processes that prevent that from happening, such as a face-to-face -face handover of that change of direct deposit information, or as some districts have done, implement uh, paper checks for two pay periods so that if someone didn't do that, they come in and ask, why am I getting paper checks? So I can tell you, I want to clarify one thing. Where the money is being sent to is very <coughs> accurate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, and it's it not the, the So what employee. I found amazing is folks, I thought they would have to verify that they have the right current bank account. They're not. Yeah. And, and the other thing that they're, that they're doing um, is for, for a few of these, they've actually gotten to the email account <coughs> and parlayed that into, hey, I'm really who I say I am. And they really got the forms. So they've understand the processes too and got the right forms to fill it out. Yeah. But a good number of these, and the ones we were giving examples of the state, they're not really in that email account. Correct. They're doing the spoofing. It's if spoofing. someone hits reply, they will see that thing is not real. If they notice it. If they notice it. But once again, it's going back to, we don't want to be, you know, you know, add a huge levels of bureaucracy to all this. But there's a part, just as you're saying, I think a very good step is an old school step. Verify before that bank account's changed that you're seeing people face to face or voice to voice and, you're, and you know their voice mm -hmm. and know that's really them. Chuck, you were going to say something earlier. Well, I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm hearing so far, and I think it's important, for our ed tech leaders, which we always look at as peers that we're talking to. We imagine mm -hmm. that all of you are sitting right here in front of us, okay, as well as the leadership within your school districts. There's a couple of themes that you already heard us alluding to, and I think, David, you kind of opened with the fact that this conversation has reached a critical point where dialogue needs to be occurring within your district leadership from the superintendent to the finance officer to the chief academic officer, and obviously you. There needs to be a leadership level discussion that's occurring about cybersecurity to keep more headlines, your district from showing up in the headlines. That's theme number one. Number two, we're getting to the point where we're gonna have to ratchet down or ratchet up, however you wanna look at it, some security best practices. Bob, you're gonna talk about these. And I know we've always tried to strike a balance between ease of access 
and security. And I've watched that pendulum swing over the years, and this is now a time when we're going to have to tighten some things down, and it's going to be a cooperation between the local level and the state level. And then lastly, this one you just touched on, man, we've got to ensure across our business processes, our technology systems, the way that we access systems, that we've got checks and balances in place to, at the end of the day, make sure we're protecting the identity of all of our end users, because that's, at the end of the day, what this is all about. And I'm not talking about identity management and architecture stuff. I'm talking about making sure that David Couch, Mike Lettingham, Bob Hackworth, our end users, our ed tech leaders, they're all protected, and they're doing their best, I'm just going to say it, to protect some of our end users from themselves at times. So this is a discussion just to the conference I just came from. And so the best, the best strategy, other than we're going to take some technical ones, is the people side. Do not underestimate the, the, the payoff that you will get of ed educating and having your teachers and your staff and your, and your financial staff Absolutely. becoming more savvy. So real example is I'm traveling to state, as most of you know, to, with superintendents. I'm talking about you know, these, these subjects, but one of the ones is superintendent came up to me afterwards and said, there was a teacher that you know, I, you know, I didn't know that well, but they got an email, it looked like it was from me, and they were so impressed that the superintendent knew who they were. And, and so, but the superintendent asked me to go get, you know, $1,000 worth of iTunes cards. They didn't question it. I don't question it, but the superintendent, you know, they must have faith in me. And so they went and bought $1,000 worth of iTunes cards and then send them the serial number that you send. I mean, you hear that. And, and of course, it was it. a dupe. Yeah. So, n number, you know, priority one is we got to get them on the really simple stuff. Uh, and we're, we maybe and maybe add a step of face to face with some of these. And there's certain positions that we think are even more important. If you have access to what I call top secret data, that's Infinite Campus. Munis has a lot of that top secret data with Social Security number or anything else that has really specific ways that can be used. Those folks need to be taken to another another level. We'll be talking about those. And you're in leadership position, or you're in charge of finances. And I, the group, what I told the group, and I know you're hitting on these, is they said, "What does Kentucky already have in place?" And I talk about, you know, the one pager that we've created. And as I travel the state talking with superintendents, I say, every staff member, this is just not for your teacher. This is for your chief financial officers. They should be reading that one pager and have it right beside mm -hmm. them that we've created. And all of them, I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of alarmed. And under superintendents, they go, this is the first time I've ever seen this. We've had that out for quite some time. That should not Years. be the first time Years. I've ever heard of it <clears throat> or I've ever seen it. And you may have told them, but I think this is one of those when you don't have to print it out and give it to them like I am. I'm, I'm actually printing it out and giving it to them. I remind them of the digital driver's license. And I tell them every staff member should do that, but especially the ones that are in charge of finances, mm -hmm. your leadership team, and your top secret data team. They should go through at the high school portion at least. I encourage you to go, you know, go through all of them. Also take a look at our, you know, don't, you know, it, it, you know where something's happened someplace else, don't let it happen to you. That's uh, what, right. What's and the name of our document with that one? Well, it, it's uh, uh, it can happen to you, but, but don't, don't let, let it. it. And that's our and that's our real life cases. And spend some time in these group meetings, going over things that have really really happened. And we're not immune to it, as you said. It, it happened to KSD yeah. for us. The the scam with the with with someone pretending deposit, yeah. paying, and, and there was people <clears throat> trying to be also helpful in the finance office. Mm -hmm. Uh, of those schools to say, well, I forgot it. I can't really remember. So he says, okay, I'll go ahead and help you. And they entered it in on their behalf when really they were entering on behalf of the, of the and, scammer. And uh, one thing I want to say is that it, it is very helpful for us, um, for Rob and Kenny to be sending this information out to superintendents, finance officers. But really, uh, the, the key, the, the magic here is when you folks at the district get together in a room and talk about it. Um, because that way you ensure that everyone is on, has the same understanding and everyone has seen the documents that kind of show what's mm -hmm. going on, how to protect, how to prevent. Yep. And so, you know, you can rely on us to send that out and, and we will do the very level best we can, but you guys there in the districts have to also come together and talk about it, just like David is with Robin and the commissioner, just like I do with David. You know, sometimes he hates to see me come in but you know, it's it's good information. It's something he needs to know. It's it's my job to make sure he knows this stuff, and I, I force him to listen to me. Always on a Friday. Always on a Friday. Four usually four to five. That's right. That's well, right. and David, there's a technique that you use up here, and I would encourage. Uh, and don't get me wrong. I know we know that we've got districts out there that are all over cybersecurity. So I never want to minimize the fact that that we're we've got some folks that have got really good skin in this game. But one of your techniques that I love is in, in trying to get the pushback off you as a leader, okay? You present not only the evidence of here's what's happening, 
All right, but here are some solutions that we can put in place. Um, those solutions may be cumbersome. Those solutions may require more time, all right? That may remove some of the convenience factor, but at the end of the day, you let that leadership team make that call. And, and that I, way they can help you manage some of the pushback that you will get as we have to address some of these things. So we've reached a point with this to where we've talked about it in our, in our recent um, summit. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about actions that we're getting ready to take. There are some things that are no longer, when, when they happen, I can't just say people are giving their best at, we're educating them. You got it. Because there are some technical things that can happen. And so that's the ones we're getting ready to talk about to where these are best practices. And it's tough for me to say we don't have these. For example, not forcing a password change more often than once a year. I can't justify that to any audience. And from the feedback I got from, uh, we all got from you from the summit, goes, you know what? We're gonna count on Katie to, to give us some cover for this. Meaning we can't do ourselves internally. But we know that's a good practice, do it. Uh, and especially in, the, in where we have self-service, you know, self, you can reset your passwords. Is before that was an incredible burden on the technology staff, but now it's not. So right. when that tool's in place, it's tough to justify saying we're not doing it. So right. we've reached a point, which I say, you know, this is a good, you know, this is a crisis, don't ever waste a good crisis, of starting to implement some things that we've talked about. Um, and, and Bob's going to talk about some of those, uh, the, the best practices on the technical side. Exactly, and, and we have, we've, we've been talking about the, the human side here for a while. We mentioned a little bit about some of the technical stuff early on, but, but uh, and I do have a document that I am going to share out with a lot of this stuff kind of on it, and I've already shared a lot of stuff with our KEs. I'm going to continue sharing stuff out with them and with CIOs directly. So don't think that uh, that's all you get is, is what you've heard in the first 20 minutes. Um, and so uh, that'll be coming out. We are going to start trying to address the technical things that we can address here. And one of them, and, and you guys knew it was coming, is, is going to be passwords access control. And so what we are going to have to do at this point, and this, I'm talking about KDE as well, is up our password game. And that means requiring, making certain minimum requirements for passwords. One of those is account threshold lockouts. You know, we're going to have to say that if, if someone uh, tries to, to log into an account and they miss it for five times or ten times, that account is going to be locked out for a period of time. That's where that uh, self-service password reset comes in handy. So if you are that person, you accidentally, you fat finger it for five, ten times, you can call and you can reset that yourself. That's that's part of what we're going to do here. We're not just going to try to make things more difficult for everybody. It's actually putting in place the technologies that make this better for the people who need them, but make it more difficult for the crooks, the attackers, the fishers, and everyone else. So, so Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, 10 seconds worth, because I don't want to break your train of thought. But the one thing we know that we've got to emphasize today also is there are some basic, I'm going to call it 101 security practices that had they been in place, could have avoided some of what we've read in the headlines as of late. And then obviously there are things to enhance that security footprint we're going to talk about. But I don't want us to lose track of the fact that there are some basic things that I think everybody would agree need to happen. David, to your point, you can't defend against. And we're going to have to get to a point where those things are no longer uh, recommended. They're no longer, we hope, that, you know what, at the end of the day, we've got to make the, we've got to put these things in place. And, and a few of those are multi-factor authentication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the password uh, complexity and how often we change that are things you can't defend it. The stale accounts yep. are things to where they're just going. And, you, and, and, I, and I know there's all these 1% things, and we'll scoot that over and deal with them, but 99% of these are, it's, it, you can't defend it. Right. And, and we're headed in a direction where, uh, and I'm talking about staff accounts right now, not, not student accounts but I'm talking about staff accounts. That's really where our risk is right now, our highest risk, and where we've done the most right. research. And uh, we're also going to have to include like admin accounts. That's going to require some more thought on that, like global admin, that sort of thing. But for staff accounts, we want to move to passphrases at this point. And we want to increase the length. And actually, we hope that we can do away with required complexity, meaning all the symbols, special symbols, capital, lower, all that sort of numbers. We want to be able to do away with that, but, and I know a lot of districts aren't using those anyway right now, but uh, we don't want to start to require those. And what we want to do is require longer passphrases and um, 
if you use a phrase, and I, I just wrote one down here off the top of my head, candy bears love jelly, that's a, a very good mm -hmm. password. Don't use that, anyone, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, I was just... It's out there. Yeah, that's I mean, yours, it's out there right. now. That's, 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 yeah. that's really, that's my banking password. Don't anyone else use it. <laughs> um, but that is a long passphrase, and you can use spaces or not, and we have the ability to use those longer passphrases now, whereas in the past we didn't. And so what I want us to do is to have, and, and Kenny tells me, and, and I believe him, there is a significant mathematical advantage to having a passphrase that's over 15 characters, that it becomes almost statistically impossible to, to get once, it's, once it hits that, that minimum requirement. At KDE, that's where we're headed. At districts, that's where I want to head. But not just with random jumbled passwords that are impossible to remember, but with things like candy bears love jelly or, or whatever else there is that, that a, a teacher or a staff person will remember. Well, the plus side of that too, you don't have to change them as often. You don't have to change them as often, especially with the multi-factor authentication. Google has implemented that on their campus and they use these little Yubi keys or similar to Yubi keys and they have not had any successful phishing since they went to multi-factor authentication. And this is just maybe a $20 device you, you, you pay, it, it, and, you, you, and that's, that's an individual right. can Or you can use a cell it. phone. There are all sorts of different ways to do yeah. multi-factor authentication. Yeah. We're going to go in that direction here. So, and, and it's, it's also, you can, you can target for some. I think I, I liked how you mentioned staff. So your leadership yeah. team, that's who the cyber criminals are targeting, target number one. Target number two, anybody that deals with finances or mm -hmm. contracts and mm -hmm. sends out money, and anyone that deals, number three, and anyone that deals with, with, with top secret data. That's right. Those who you need to go one, two, three in your district. Now, <coughs> does everyone need to do it? You, you help determine that. But definitely here for K, the agency, we're starting out those three non-optional. That's right. Uh, and then the rest of them, it is a best practice. And at some point, we may do it for all of them. Mm -hmm. It is a best practice to do for all of them. It is. It definitely is. Um, and, and that's what we, where we want to get to because um, at some point, as, 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 again, the technology becomes hardened, they start to find the crooks, start to find other ways to get in there and, and work that system. And, 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 and really I think another thing we talked about, um, and Marty, uh, the, the, the authentication for Infinite Campus, yep. right? right that's, that's part of this kind of three-pronged approach. We want the SSPR, the self-service password reset, because that makes it better for real people. We want to do passphrases and actually make passwords easier than they've been, even though they're longer. That's second. And then third is single sign-on. So the, the fewer times you have to actually enter that password, the better. And so that's also going to mean that as technology and as our vendors improve their password game, which they're doing, then we're going to try to keep up with them. And so as Microsoft and Google move towards a passwordless environment, we're going to move there too. So the pushback of districts could be, I don't have single sign-on. How many don't have it? Single sign-on? Or, 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 I'm sorry, uh, self-service SSPR, I think we've only got a couple that have implemented it. However, here's what we do know. We know that any district that has an EES, which I think there's about 130 that do, yeah. they have the ability to turn that on literally today for free. And obviously Microsoft can help them walk down that path. A lot of districts have figured it out themselves. We've implemented so, so it. So we got to work. There, there's a sense of ur ur urgency to figure out why districts aren't doing that. Uh, and, and just far as, as far as those 130 say, this is coming, it's coming very quickly. So I guess the, 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 the ed tech leader has a choice. They cannot implement it and take all the people calling in to say, I need my password reset. So they can choose not to and deal with that, or they can deal with, you know, in, implement a serv you know, service that allows them to do with that. Well, what right. you're getting at, David, and I was, I, got to, I was privy to a really awesome strategic discussion between Bob and Marty yesterday, talking about the four or five different pieces that we know make up this puzzle and the sequencing that each needs to go in to make sure that both on the IT administration side as well as the end user side that you can implement this stuff as smoothly and as transparently as possible. So it does require some thought. It requires some planning. It requires some communication. It requires some buy-in from leadership. All these things we've talked about. So today. the third strand of that, we are, we are wanting the goal to have it in by January, I think, for that, right, for, for Infinite Campus. Correct. And I think we have, I'd like to see a couple of the responses to our, our poll questions, if we could, for question one and two. I think those are related to uh, what we've been asking. Um, and, you know, and I, and I would be agree agreeing with this, Bob, is we have a sense of urgency. And I know, I know people would like to wait, but we know schools, we, it's tough during the summer mm -hmm. break, but I do think that October time frame, um, and that's good to see that, that, that wow. many up there, yeah. is we've got to go because we're just going to have more 
and more of this, and it's going to be embarrassing. And all these, the bottom line, you start losing trust of the public. Yeah. It's embarrassing, humiliating for the district. But you start losing trust of the public, and you really keep up with what's going on up there. So I do I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you know, David, a teaching point, and I, I always try to stay one step ahead of you, which sometimes is pretty easy and sometimes it's not. All right. Um, no pun intended, no reference to anything else. But I, I, as an ed tech leader, never want to be in the position of something embarrassing happening to the organization that I work for and the leaders of that organization showing up in the newspaper knowing that I could have implemented something at my fingertips that would have prevented that from happening. But in this you know a good I mean? chance, you know, we got the cyber, you know, annual cybersecurity health check mm -hmm. coming up. It's due in August. You don't have to wait that long. That's right. You can do and it. this is a great opportunity, I think, to start introducing that in the August time frame to the board on where they're at and where they're getting ready to go. Absolutely, and that's what uh, I plan on doing here at KDE. <coughs> and I think the KDE yeah, you know, we are going to do uh, our best to try to assist districts in understanding how these things should be implemented, and we're going to be working with other states to try to figure out best practice for that sort of stuff as we move forward. I've seen a lot of districts already calling in and asking how to implement DKIM and DMARC to help uh, reduce the amount of spoofs and fishes. That's great. And so that, that I think we've got a head of steam. I, I definitely want to capitalize on that. And uh, this is what we'll be really working on for the next couple of months and really pushing for. Uh, Mar Marty, you, find it, you, you had a comment you want to say? Can you, and you, can, you hear, can you hear him or does he need to come up here? Okay. Come on up. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so, um, and, and Bob, to, to your point, um, I think that it's, it's really important, all those strategies, whether it's our di a district who um, stays in G Suite and Google Space a, a lot versus Microsoft, both partners are implementing these these strategies that's right um, extremely well and to right. high levels and as you said as as that those technologies improve we're going to be able to be in a position to go right along with them diana mcgee uh, asked a great question they've implemented um, some uh, password strategies with complexity and so her her question is you know if we move statewide to pass phrases for example and, and really get at that length um, mm -hmm. approach then you know, would districts be required to follow along with that um, from a complexity? You know, complexity, complexity is always good. Yeah. It is. Length trumps everything else, though. And so my, my own passwords are both complex and longer. So it's an option. It's an option. So we're not getting rid of complexity at all. It, it, that remains an option. If you want to put a tilde in there, then feel free. If you want to use numbers and capitals and lowercase, but it's not acceptable you have complex because the phrases are they're easier to remember they're easier that's, to remember. that's what we don't want to have you have complexity and you're writing them all down that defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do that's right we want to make these more memorable for people so if you want to use a, a, a number three for an e or something like that if you want to use capital letters lowercase letters if you want to make sure that there are no legitimate dictionary words in your password right. That does increase the strength. Can we see the, the response to question two? And while that's pulling up, also would love to point out um, when we talk about um, uh, updating or upgrading our passwords, we've done this statewide over the last six years twice. Yeah, only and twice. this is not shocking to me that on question number one, that folks are like October is a great time frame. It's not too early uh, because we we've, we've gone through this strategy before. And so we, we, we understand um, that, that threshold. This is really good information for me to have and, and good information for us to share with Robin and other folks because now with this information, it helps us target and, and maybe change our, uh, our message out uh, for this. And, and I think that it might be helpful for us to find out about some other uh, uh, scams and, and see if folks are aware of those as well. So obviously we spend you know, two hours on this topic, but we wanted to give you a point of emphasis. This is a, a national tsunami. And if you don't think you're being targeted, you are. And the smallest district, you need to have those passwords separated. Don't, I mean, I know it's difficult. You got a lot of, not a lot of responsibilities, but they're taking advantage of that. Don't, don't eliminate, we were, we've talked about you know, technical solutions, don't eliminate getting them savvy. Getting them all, all up there, because you got to have them all their game up. And that's nothing to solve at all. But we do have a difficult part explaining to folks why we don't have multi-factor authentication, why we don't have passwords of a certain length, why they're not changed so often, why we still have so many stale accounts. Those can't be described to the public and, and at, at my level or at any level. So we're going to move very aggressively in this. And, and so you can talk with us one-on-one. -on -one or I know the field staff are having these discussions. Absolutely. We're talking with superintendents with it. So 
you should not have to feel like you're alone in this discussion. And, and David, our intention is to release some target dates for password upgrade practices, yes. as well as target dates for SSO, single sign-on with our big applications and things Come like on that. Up, yeah. so, so are you telling me that I don't have two hours right now? No, you're, 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 you're not. But Bob is <laughs> always I available. Two hours. Bob is always available. Um, uh, That's right. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, we're going to hit Windows uh, the 7 patch here in a little bit, Phil. So let's, uh, Linda's going to give an update, a real quick update on the school report card. Yes, David. Um, the new finance tab was released two weeks ago, and it's the final component in the 2017-18 school card. Right. Um, this information is released later than the rest of the information on yeah. the card, but right. that's by design, yep. and that gives the districts uh, the opportunity to use audited information yep. for their calculations. Yep. Um, the new tab, it reports the funding, spending, and tax information for each district, um, as well as the school and district spending per student. And um, this release, it also provided a new tool that allows the districts to compare up to four organizations at the state, right. district, and school levels. Um, now this compare tool has likely sparked some conversations at the local level about how schools and districts are performing, um, yep. you know, compared to each other, uh, and then as as, with the state as a whole. So we want to encourage everyone when they're using this data um, that it's to keep in mind that it's financial data is very complex and this is just one small picture of the whole story. <coughs> so then uh, to emphasize this we're working with Breitbites and we've asked them uh, to uh, add an explanation on the finance tab about using the information. Be something about the card viewers should use this data to encourage conversations but not as the sole basis for their conclusions right so you know just the bottom line of that is um, um, you know just let your superintendent know what, what's happening is they're, they're comparing schools and someone says why is school X getting more than school Y and there's a lot to go into that so that's why exactly. this is on here it is is it, the, the folks that are looking at it to understand there needs to be a broader discussion about all the things that are, the shared services this district provides the things going out that provide you know, a, spe a specific school. So that's being added to add some clarity and hopefully they have the conversations there. So uh, make, make sure your superintendent's aware that that's coming in the very near future. Yes, it will okay. be. Right. And of course they can find all four components of the school report card at raisethebar.education.ky.gov. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, uh, online testing, Mike, and, and, and Phil, I'm going to add you do the Windows 7 patch uh, afterwards. So, Mike, yeah, and uh, sure. I'll just mention, because I know we have Paul's name on there as well. Paul is our engineer that works with the Office of Assessment and Accountability on online testing. So, he's on top of everything going on every day, and most of you all probably have heard his name out in the districts because he sends out a lot of information through the KEs and sometimes directly. But uh, he's available if we got into any questions or anything that was needed, but uh, I don't even necessarily need to worry about being here at the webcast. So anyway, good story, obviously. Uh, we have great success, great results with online testing. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the on-demand writing and science operational tests, we've had over 73,000 tests completed today. Very few incidents. Um, we had a, an incident with the uh, online dictionary that uh, went through a few iterations of figuring out exactly what the problem was there. The problem ended up being something that was kind of not directly related to Pearson or to anything here in Kentucky. Uh, it was kind of on the, the network uh, between the two, if you will, in, in, the, uh, on the, in the internet. Uh, but it was isolated and, and, and figured out, so that's, that's been taken care of. And then, we, of course, we had the patch that's come out, which was not an incident necessarily, but it's something we had to deal with, which Phil, I'll let you speak to that right here in a minute. Um, then we've had some individual incidents in school districts, which Pearson has been able to respond to very quickly um, and help resolve. I know of one district that had a major issue as far as the district as a whole, uh, and Pearson, as well as our staff, are actually going on site to that district to help kind of figure out what caused that because there's something that is unique there that's caused some kind of a... A, a bigger disruption and a problem when it comes to online testing. So, um, the uh, field test, you know, completes been uh, 91,000 tests were completed with the field testing that's already done, and then with the operational testing, the like I just mentioned, we're at uh, 73,000. We expect that number to be nearly the same whenever June 7th comes around, which is the end of that that testing cycle for that. So, uh, 
been very successful. I, I guess one of the things we really want to make sure we get is feedback. Uh, we want to make sure that you guys are being involved in what's going on and aware because this is only going to get bigger um, as we go forward. Um, and so this success has allowed us to even, you know, be more confident in doing that, but we certainly need to know uh, and get the feedback on challenges or struggles or anything that people have observed that uh, are things that we want to take into consideration going forward. So obviously we had, and Phil, I want you to speak to the, sure. the past that we did. I, you know, we, we really try to have a, a moratorium in place when we're doing testing to not do patches or anything like that, but by the same token, there's always a reason for exception, which we felt like there was for this particular right. patch. So you can just speak to it and kind of, and, and sure. I will say real quick, well, you can say it. I was going to say I don't know of any issues that it caused. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far we don't know of any issues that it's caused. Uh, you know, patch management is only one layer of security that we have uh, in KDE or in the K2, K-12 through environment. And it's always been very, very successful. But we've always been real sensitive to online testing and tried not to push patches just for the sake of pushing patches. So we really went a couple of months now without doing our normal patch cycle uh, for K-12. through However, the Windows 7 patch that came out last week, the, the vulnerabilities that were described in that and the threat level was so high that we felt like we just needed to go ahead and do that. So we did that on Friday. The intention was to get all of those workstations that were gonna do testing uh, patched by Monday, so when testing started, they wouldn't be uh, impacted by the weight. And it seems like that that's been successful. We don't know exactly, you know, how successful that's been, but we haven't really heard anything negative. And uh, but that is unusual for us to push a patch right. during the window that we've described as uh, as online testing. So, but uh, in lieu of all that, we feel like we need to get the next patch cycle out, and that will be. We're going to target June the 10th for that, uh, so that's uh, that's when we have the next pa next normal patch cycle come out, and that's a probably a couple months, you know, past due, and a lot, so it'll be a. a and that'll cycle, be after the so. window. That'll uh, be after the yeah. window, yeah. So the way I look at the patches, you know, obviously if the patch was applied, we've not seen any issues. Which the biggest concern there was the patch itself going to cause an issue. Sure. Right. If machines didn't get patched then the re reality is they're still going to work. They were working before. It's just a matter they're still vulnerable for what the patch was being applied for. And, you know, so. and, and we, uh, we actually worked with, with Pearson. We worked with, uh, and we, we tried to test this. We tried to do as much research as possible, and we felt like that this was a, safe way to, a safer way to go than to leave the machines unpatched yeah. because of that particular vulnerability. So. But always remember, and we, and we still have about 70,000 uh, Windows 7 workstations in the K-12 environment. And that does go end of life, as Chuck keeps reminding me almost daily uh, at the end of this year. January of, January of 2020. And, and I, I like to point out, we talked about this uh, mm -hmm. yesterday, that, you know, Phil, we, we had uh, at the end of uh, June of last yes. year, we had about yeah. 120,000. Right, right. And so over six to eight months, we've made a significant, a right, significant yeah. increase. Yeah. Well, as you said, Mike, big success. Um, all the you know on-demand writing, math and reading, science, and that leads into the next topic because I do think one of the one of our biggest justifications on being able to get increased funding <laughs> is related around online testing. Um, I, you, what I've laid out uh, before you is the five areas. That and the five reasons that we're giving rationale for an increase in the CATS funding. And so you see $30 million is going to be requested. But to make you understand the difference, where we're at right now, we're at $15.3 million. In 1992, it started out at $19.5 million. And so we're asking for an increase of $14.7 million to the, the CATS funding. And so that's why we have the question up that I'm going to take a look at, because it's going to need your support of you just not saying it's for me, of you going and, and, and communicating and championing this with your superintendent, with your CFO, because legislators talk to them um, and they get their view of, well, what do you think about this? And, and the more that you have the superintendent and the CFO, and ideally you also talk with them, uh, the legislator too, they go, okay, this is something that we need to do. Because uh, I'm going to explain to you the process that, that this, this goes through. But definitely we're, done a, we're, we're trying to address uh, um, the, the increasing the financial offers of assistance. 
um, through this whole process, and you can do a variety of things with that. Uh, you can you know, replace your student teacher devices or any kind of other school technology you have there. Uh, it's also being done to be targeted with those increased offers that you can better address the people side. You know, I'm traveling the state talking about the importance, this big gap that we have in the number of people, and be honest with you, what they're paid. Um, and to help you address that, for the, do you get the right number of technicians in your district? Do, do, do you get the right number of digital learning coaches to address the six pillars of leadership that we're traveling in this state doing? And talking about, do you have someone covering security? Do you have someone, you know, cover overall air, air traffic controller for the data? And as I tell superintendents, if you don't superintendent, that means it's you. And I say it as bluntly as that. And at some point they're going, I don't want, that, that should not be me. Uh, it needs to be somebody else and start funding the role, especially if we start having these incidences of security incidences it's not across the state, the technology is not maximized instruction or it's not reliable, then that starts getting their attention. And, and we, are, we are making some headway in doing that. <coughs> Increasing the bandwidth definitely is part of that. Uh, we need that for the online testing as well as upgrading the, the devices that we have out there. We haven't done anything with the basic cost of increase in, in, since 1992. Cost of living. Cost I'm sorry, it's so cost of living increase. Yeah. So for example, Munis has had a small one every year since right. 1992. Uh, I guess 95 since we started out with them and and so nothing so we've just had to absorb that and absorb that and plus we've had six million dollars worth of cuts since 2008 so it's, it's, it's restoring those so uh, I'd like to see what your response is to the question I think it's question three that we have up there on this <laughs> all right I'm glad to see that zero. all right that's, that's pretty, that's pretty, pretty that's it's that's going zero. off the screen actually yeah 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 <laughs> so let's go to number four <laughs> but the results of question four, and this is where can we can we count can we count on you to help champion that with your superintendent CFO and others? Oh, that's good to see too. Yeah, and so you can go right through the list of the reasons we're we're needing to do that, and and the others is the district, or, or I'm sorry, the representatives and the senators that represent you. Make sure, and I'm, as I'm traveling to state, I'm sharing here's what we already have in place. Here's the success that we're having. The, the, I call it the greatest hits. You know, you cherish, you appreciate, and you protect what you have. And it's that greatest hits album of that, that one pager that shows what we've been doing since 1992. Mm -hmm. that, that we're the pioneer and the national leader in education technology in so many areas. That we've not squandered it. Uh, and we've maximized it. And this helps us, you know, keep it going and expand upon it, what I call the, the, the Kate principle. So and, that, that's good and, to see. And obviously, and David, you said that those local conversations are critical because those are the difference that's, makers when it comes to our decision makers uh, in the legislature yeah. here in Kentucky. And then also sharing of the examples and ideas um, of things that, you know, the kind of conversations that occur and the examples that are able to be used and shared, making sure that we share those uh, across the state so that we all have, you know, the, those those conversations yeah. in our tool belt. And it, it goes to a couple of steps I want to make you aware of. Uh, you know, first of all, I, we submitted here. Uh, so Katie has to initiate that as one of its priorities. Then our state board has to say, yes, this will be one of our top priorities. Then the governor's office comes out with additional an, an initial budget in the January time frame. <coughs> it, it, it really helps if it's in there, but it doesn't have to be in there. Um, but it does help along the path. And then uh, the, the legislature, you know, votes to approve or, you know, add to the governor's budget or take away from the governor's budget. So it's a long process. And we've been somewhat successful with other parts before, but we have reached a point where we need increased funding. And if not, we're going to talk about the consequences of that not happening. So we, we're, we're, we've reached it. We, I think we've maximized it as well as any uh, DOE and a partnership with school districts can. Uh, and we're going to start to go backwards if we don't start addressing it. Uh, two points, David, real quick. I think this is the first time in the history of our webcast that we've had two questions back to back with 100%. 100% yes. Uh, but but uh, historically, when we have um, had some successful conversations from a budget increase perspective, uh, Mike, you, you pointed out and nailed, we've had some key district leaders step up and yes, really help push. And, and I think, you know, today is, is another nudge for regionally, region by region, if we can you know, really work with some key district leaders to help push it forward. And I'll give you an example, Charlotte Wright of Anderson County. Yeah, yeah. One single person yeah. helped us get an increase of, I want to say it was $5 million at one time for something, yeah. uh, for education. It was her. Yeah. And she worked on it. So don't think, well, it's too big. And one, per one person uh, it might, might th can make a difference. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I think of Vicki Fields did the same thing up in Kenton County. She worked it. 
and worked on her legislators and it got and it got momentum so don't think well i just can't do it it's too big i mean one person and i've seen it happen uh, before actually uh, marina horn did the same thing yeah uh, if i can yeah yeah so uh in, in all those roles uh marty stlp uh, i know we talked about this <laughs> at, at, at the event we were in jeff i hope you're watching um <laughs> yeah so david we're, we're um you know every year we're faced and we with you know some pretty big challenges we are the single largest one-day event um, at the Rupp Arena. Um, that's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. It's <laughs> that's amazing. Where, where that's us. Okay. And, 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 and they love us. The staff there love that, working with us. And they go us. above and beyond to help us, yeah. Definitely go above and beyond. And, and, and so it's a one-day event for us from a state championship perspective, but it's actually two days or a day and a half in terms of setup. And, yeah. and so um, we, we wanted to take a second just to, to really make sure it's clear. Like we're, we're working with a lot of different partners and uh, at the convention center and in, in, in Lexington to make sure that that those days are successful. We had a great um, state championship this year. A lot of successes. We grew in some areas that we wanted to, um, but we also learned some. So it's not perfect yet, right? And and so we're also going through the process at the uh, facility where there's construction, and you know we know that this upcoming year is really the last year that we'll have the same design um, if we keep it at that facility, right? So. Um, so we had some options. We had three options of when to have state championship, um, and, and as we as we've discussed pretty hard again because we we want to make sure that it's extremely successful like it has been. But we want to uh, those three options were, were not good. <laughs> but just to just to be clear, we had and it's because of you saying we're the full day, yes. we're the largest they do, and we require two days, and and for them to find that was 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 difficult. Yeah. There, there is one uh, that that we've landed on, but. Yeah. But the other two weren't really options. Yeah, they, and I shouldn't say they weren't good. They just weren't. Well, they perfect. weren't good. I they mean, were perfect. Two, them, right? two of them were really pretty bad. Right. Yeah. So, so next year's state championship um, will be on April eighth, um, and uh, one option that we had was during the assessment window, which can't do it then. We definitely cannot do at that point. We know that there's many districts who are actively in um, assessment, and so yeah. we're we're going to avoid that at all costs. Another date that we had. Um, was early March before Kisti, which would have been um, a really extreme challenge for us, um, and also well, weather permitting. Yeah, right? I mean, you've had we went back in time and uh, been you know sub below uh, zero. All yeah. it takes is a little bit of snow, and we got people traveling all over the state. There is no makeup day. We don't get oh, by, by the way, Rupp Arena, we couldn't make it. Can we? Yeah, there is none. There, there was none, and and just to. Just to be clear, we, we actually went through year by year for the last 10 years to look yeah. and like it, what kind of decision is this, and, and we just landed on it. It wasn't a great decision. There's too much risk involved with that early March date. Yeah. Um, and so April 8th is that date. The, the downside of April 8th for us is that we know that we do have districts uh, on spring break at that time, um, but we're gonna work as best we can to make sure that we have and, and, and include um, any district that, even though they're on spring break, definitely can still participate. We've had that in the past, um, where districts were on spring break, but students. Where's Mike says this could be their spring break. Right. It it could be, it could be a great. And it's not all break. districts choose that week. Yeah. I know it's, it's it's between the you know three different. And our problem right now is that those calendars are not um, all published yet, to where we yeah. can get a clean look at it. We do yeah. know that some of our districts who really help and volunteer in some of our lead categories um, <coughs> are on spring break, so we're actively working with those folks to clean that up. But we just we wanted to make that announcement, make sure that everyone's aware that we know that that April 8th date is not perfect for everybody, um, but, but we still are very confident it's going to be an awesome experience and an, an awesome state championship. And we do still see and, and believe that there will be growth, continued growth um, in this upcoming year, just like there has been over the last five. You got the next one with academic standards, a quick update yeah. of the process, and then some. we have some summer education technology ready yeah. PD. Um, so just a, a real quick update, um, our, our academic standards team, and these are the Kentucky academic standards for technology, um, and these are standards, um, academic standards wrapped around using technologies to learn and enhance learning. Um, and so our team met for the first time three weeks ago. Um, it was absolutely awesome. We had 30 folks in the room from all across the state. Um, and, and we're gonna move really fast on this. Laura Raganos is leading this effort um, for us. And, and then last week there was a, a, an, an additional uh, meeting online 
and we took another major step forward. We think the work will move pretty, uh, pretty quickly um, to where we can get some draft standards out for folks. Um, they will be, at this point, we know that they will be based uh, on some, some of the ISTE uh, standards framework. Um, we've looked at four or five other states um, and compared and contrast, and we, we have a couple states that have some pretty good work that just finalized a little bit ahead of us, and so we're going to be leveraging their work as well. Um, but we're really excited about it, and, and we think it'll be a great plug-in. Just as a reminder, those absolutely are tied into uh, minimum graduation requirements um, by demonstrating competency in technology, and these are the competencies. To, to leverage and so uh, that academic standard set will move forward we also are moving forward with our library um, media framework um, that's tied to standards and will be tied to moving uh, that work forward you know we spent some time in, in one of our big deal things is the people side of what we do right um, a lot of the security discussion this morning was about the people side it's not just um, leap from a leadership perspective but also it's also skilling each other up and gaming up on um, strategies and, and learning tied to that and so from a people side perspective uh, super important to to uh, push on and give a shout out to all of the events that are happening this summer I mean we're getting ready to kick into high gear on conference season again where um, there are just a ton of professional learning opportunities for from a digital learning perspective and I would say too is I know you the, the first representative may not be involved with this but when I ask you if you're watching the webcast go let the appropriate person yes. in your district be aware <coughs> of this even though you may not be doing you know instructional technology right. of technology instruction please let the appropriate person in your district know this it, I, I'm gl really glad that you said it that way um, the way that another way to say that is you know no one owns this right we all no one individually owns it we all own the work from a digital learning from maximizing the effective use of the technology whether it's teachers administrators mm -hmm. students and so uh, just a shout out to a couple big events erratic um, is getting ready to pull district leaders together. <coughs> going to have teachers there their threads are all wrapped around um, our cats master plan which is awesome to see mm -hmm. how they've integrated that um, the IFL conference in Lexington uh, we are involved in uh, Fayette County does an awesome job of leading that and last year uh, I believe they had 80 to 100 districts represented there um, uh, there's there's major events and a big shout out to KY go digital events that are happening across the state um, if you're not sure where to get all this information um, what we've tried to do is if you go to the uh, Kentucky Department of Education website education.ky.gov and just do a quick search for digital learning um, we've posted an integrated calendar with all these events that that are going on throughout the state um, from a pres professional learning perspective uh, we're trying to plug into those as much as possible we're helping lead events um, but th this is district-led mostly um, higher eds involved our co-ops are involved in all these events um, so please plug into those um, KY go digital events are going to be awesome um, <coughs> and so just just wanted to take a second to mention that Thanks. Are we getting anything, I mean, just on the, the web, the stuff on that go soapbox we need to address before we move on to Cat's View? Okay. So uh, a, a quick update, Phil, on just, uh, I guess, the sure. new, new Cat's View and just internet health check. Okay. Right. So we do have a new uh, version of Cat's View. That's a tool that districts use almost daily, I think, right. okay. uh, to, to watch and kind of look and see visually mm -hmm. what their bandwidth usage is. And uh, that's been a tool that has been very, very uh, successful over many, many years in, in, in CAS. And, and so we do have a new version we launched on April the 9th. I did send an email out about that to the CIO, so they should be aware of that. From an internet health perspective, we still are maintaining a three nines, 99.9% uptime during the instructional day. However, we have seen a lot of fiber cuts in the past two to three weeks. It's just been really <coughs> unusual. Now, in fact, we had one district that had two fiber cuts in one week. So uh, we continue to work with AT&T and, and, you know, and how we recover from that faster. And so that's, when you say fiber, that's, that's probably someone with a backhoe. With a backhoe. Or, uh, didn't realize they were digging it up, digging it up. So it's mm -hmm. unintended right. fiber mm -hmm. cut, not someone doing it, but sure. someone not paying attention to certain and things. And one was a up. car wreck, I think, that took out a, a telephone pole that had fiber strung in early. So. Yeah. Uh, and those things can't be helped. Those, yeah. and, and so we, uh, we we realize that you know that we try to recover as fast as we can from those. But we realize that those are sometimes unintentional and can't be helped. 
We did have an average use of 48% almost 50 or 48 gig, almost 50 gig of internet usage. Mm -hmm. We do have an 80 gig pipe, so just kind of keep that in mind that as we hit these peaks, which I think the peak we hit last month was 63 gig, as we hit these peaks and we, we as that average grows, then we, you know, we take a look at what do we do with that 80 gig? Do we go to 160? Do we add more to that? And so we always keep an eye on that. Just kind of telling on the uh, tail end of the security discussion, we have another layer of security called our DDoS protection. And I want uh, us to talk about that a little bit. And Andy, I think I have a something we can kind of throw up there. 114 DDoS attacks against K-12 schools in Kentucky since January 1 of this year. Now, why is that number significant? We only had 118 all during the year of 2018. Or, or yeah, 118 DDoS attacks all last year. So already this year, up through the end of March, because I don't have April and May yet, we have 114 in three months. So uh, we mitigated 100 of those. And if we had not mitigated those, it equals 70, if you can do the math, there are about 72 hours of total downtime or impacting time to uh, instruction. Because we did our mitigation, we uh, brought that down to seven hours of total uh, time that Im impacted the school district. We are working on that number with AT&T to put some things in place that will go from, let's say, a 15 or 20 minute <coughs> mitigation process down to less than a five minute. So uh, just wanted to kind of share, share, share that with you all. As you all can tell, we have many layers of security throughout our whole system. And uh, we've not talked about but a few of those today, but obviously the people side, as Marty said, and as Bob and David have talked about, very, very important. That's, a, that's a really a key. Uh, is, is getting the people to, you know, kind of savvy on this stuff, so. Thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm. So I know our field staff, uh, Chuck, are meeting with all the districts um, in, in, their, in, their, in their groups, and this is an issue that's right up there, uh, uh, to me, with the cyber security. So I want to spend a little time giving you some PD and educating you on the KH3 contract, um, and then why it's important, what it does for us, and, 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 the, and the risk that are associated with us not having uh, something like that in place. So the K Street contract um, is paid every month by KD to the K Street uh, uh, vendor. And that vendor then turns around and shares the money monthly with the, the 14 telcos that are part of that. And that provides both middle mile, we already have a middle mile network in every district in Kentucky, and it's coming through this one that we have with um, KH3, and we also have a last mile to every KH3 internet hub in a district. Uh, we call that a last mile provider. Now, you take that in districts one more level and take it down to your schools, but we have a, what we call a KD KH3 internet hub in every district, and there's 14 vendors that provide that last mile connection into that district hub um, th throughout, throughout our state, and they all get a cut of that money. So when we pay for the KH contract every month, all 14 of those are being paid monthly as well, not necessarily directly by us, but through the contract. So they're getting paid. So that, that person, that organization coming in is getting a monthly paycheck uh, from, from KDE. Uh, number two, I think, important part. Whenever we do the KH biz that we've done since 1992, we go after vendors that are proven and have been able to deliver high quality, high capacity, extremely reliable fiber internet service. And Phil, I know we go back and forth with this, you know, Kentucky K-12 is about 25 times bigger if you take a look at the load of things that we're doing. We, we have 750,000 total, uh, you know, students and teachers administrators total. The rest of state government combined has 30,000. Yeah. Plus we're power users of video and audio and the other parts of, of, of the internet. So we consume a lot more bandwidth uh, than the average uh, organization. We are also the national leader in cloud-based computing, which means we have to have a stable uh, network. It all comes tumbling down if we have a low quality, low reliability network in place. And so that's why we do those bids. We're going after the very be you know, best one in place that, that, at the time. And there's typically maybe 10 or 15 that, that, that start in that, that area. Uh, to, to, to compete for that business, but that's an important part of this. 
And that needs to be an important part to you, is the quality of it, the maintaining the quality we have in place. The third item is E-rate. We always get an E-rate eligible contract. And what that means to you all in districts over the next 30 years is approximately up to $800 million in education technology funding. It doesn't take long for us to get there. We apply for E-rate rebates because it's an E-rate contract. We get that money back. We send it to you all. You match it equally. <coughs> now, some of you even take it another level and apply for E-rate rebates locally. That's about $800 million that we gain or put at risk by not using an E-rate eligible contract that it directly impacts your all's budgets and districts. That's $800 million to your all's, that's not the KD budget of Red Tech, that is your all's budget directly. So that's always been important to us to make sure we don't do something that jeopardizes a high quality service and reliable service for all the reasons we've mentioned and does not jeopardize E-rate funding. The fourth item is just the easement. So any vendor that comes on your one foot on your property, one inch on your property, I'll go one foot on your property, um, requesting easement rights, and those include internet service providers, uh, must be approved by KDE. KDE reviews it, and the, 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 the provider must agree to uh, some conditions, um, quite a few conditions. It also requires the local district's board approval before, before anybody comes onto your property and puts on an internet uh, fiber line and, and brings it you know, really, really close to the existing KH3 hub that we have in, in place in the district. So we've had some examples, and I want to share, share with you a couple with you. So anyone that tries to force their way onto your property, they've obviously not gone through the proper steps of getting easement rights from KD and your local board. And we've had that over the past three years. We just say, no, you cannot come on this property and put your, your, your fiber line uh, on the property, anywhere on the property, or anywhere toward or near the existing KH3 hub that we have in place. The other one is, I call it trick or circumvention. And you can say this is slimy as well. You can probably put that one in there uh, as well. Um, and so you have um, someone that says, well, I want to give you some more voice capacity, but you really find out their main goal is to put in a separate internet fiber line that's really close to the KH3 internet hub that we have in place. Um, of course, that's misleading. That's not straightforward, the reason that they're doing it, uh, but obviously they have an intention to try to put it in there. Um, another example is they pays your current KH3 last mile vendor. So we, we have 14, as I mentioned, uh, and, you'll, and you know who yours is coming <coughs> to the district for the KH3 hub. So your, your last mile vendor puts one in on behalf of what I call vendor X, and then gets paid by vendor X, and then vendor X takes ownership of that line soon afterward. So Vendor X, in essence, has circumvented the process they should have gone through. And then your, your last mile provider, fighter, and I, I know this is a legal term, is aided and abetted uh, or allowed or tolerated or been part of and contributed to in that happening. And so they're double dipping, in fact, is they're getting paid through the K3 contract, but also they found a way to say, you know what, I also get paid for this as well. But they're part of something that has circumvented the right process uh, to, to do it. So, and, and there's also the slimy one example I give is, well, we'll put it in place, and then as soon as we take a picture of it and get paid for, we'll take it out. Now, you gotta know something's really, really wrong with all those scenarios, yes? David, when you mentioned circumvented the right process, and, and just to reiterate what you said earlier, that, that right process is a process that ensures that our funding for all of these services stay intact. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's making sure that, uh, first of all, there, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, and I, I say there's a variety, but one of those is make sure we're not jeopardizing yep. our E-rate funding. Uh, that, that's one of the steps that we're, that, that, that's part of that. But there's just steps they should do. Any provider that comes on your land um, for easement rights, uh, for anything, and these are a long list of providers, but they have to go through a process to get approval. So I want to make sure you, you, you've heard that, and, and this is for all, anyone, any, any provider, just not, you know, I gave an example of Vendor X, but it could be a variety of them. I know our field staff are, are once again reiterating this, and it's maybe a discussion you want to have with your last mile provider just directly and say, listen, don't try to use that technique. And, and, if, and, and once again, it gives you, you know, some confidence if someone just shows up and says, here, I'm here to put this internet fiber line into your district, the, the quick answer is no. Uh, no one should ever be showing up and doing that. Um, and, and, you know, we tried our best when we found out about let folks not to do that. 
So I don't know if there's anything else I need to say that, but I just want to give a heads up, uh, heads up to that. Um, next item is upcoming RFIs and RFPs. Yeah, I've got a few different items I'm going to cover here real quickly uh, under that kind of umbrella of, of category. So what I want to talk about a couple of things in process, uh, and we've mentioned these before, so I'll just mention them real quickly. And that's one is the out of band management uh, solution that exists in every district. Uh, that's something that we're uh, will be moving on here fairly soon to implement a, a replacement, a change to that. One of the things I have, I don't think I've mentioned this yet. The KEs may have mentioned it in their lo in their local meetings, is that uh, we anticipate districts being able to eliminate a. a uh, a line that they're currently paying for and may have to maintain and have been having to maintain into their district hub sites uh, as part of that so uh, while it's a small thing uh, we do anticipate the districts will be able to observe a little savings there and again you'll learn more about that your KEs will advise you on that and then the uh, the switch replacement for the uh, all the district hubs that is in motion um, so we're, we're moving that to a service and, and replacing those outdated serve uh, switches so that's another implementation and again we've mentioned that one before that's in, in process. <clears throat> a few other things. Obviously, we talk about Active Directory. I'm not going to talk about Active Directory specifically, but as part of Active Directory, we're looking at how we do the infrastructure associated with Active Directory. So that's a, an initiative we've got working on that we're working on. Um, whether that results in an RFP process or not, or whether that exists results in us utilizing some existing contracts that are available to us, we haven't quite decided yet. But uh, that's an activity we've got going on. And again, I think we've mentioned that before. KEs may mention that whenever they're talking to districts, but it falls under that umbrella because a driving factor of that infrastructure as a service, which is part of what we're looking at, is associated to Active Directory. Um, and so that's uh, part of, of uh, something we're working on. The other uh, a big initiative, a huge initiative that we are working on is the Kentucky Education Certification and Ethics System. Um, and uh, you may have heard us mention that before and call it the Education Licensure System. Uh, it has been uh, kind of officially named now the Education Certification and Ethics System, and that's a that's a part of an effort for the department as a whole. Uh, you know, EPSB Education Professional Standards Board moved under the department over the last year, and there's a multitude of things that that uh, organization now in office here in the department uh, oversees. And it has many many applications associated to it, so we're undergoing an effort. To, uh, to really try to put an umbrella over top of all of those functions and all of those applications under one common system that we, would, again, are referring to as the Kentucky Education Certification and Ethics System. Um, and that will likely, uh, it, it will be a big initiative. It is a big initiative. It's underway. It is officially underway. Yeah. But as we go forward with that, and one of our first steps is to do a, a request for information, which is uh, preliminary a lot of times to doing an RFP. Uh, most likely we'll end up doing an RFP uh, after that uh, to, to move on trying to get all of those things captured under a new system. I don't know if you, Marty, I yeah, like you okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just want to mention, and no announcement uh, by any means, but just the thinking wrapped around when we're looking at new RFPs, and, and David and I uh, talked with many states last week about interoperability and making sure that when new partners um, are established, that data is flowing in between. You know, for example, Infinite Campus and Google announced a big uh, uh, piece last week where there's interoperability between rosters and grades coming from um, Google Classroom back to Infinite Campus. And, you know, we think about teacher certification systems and, you know, all of that data should seamlessly flow um, back and forth with our other big partners like Infinite Campus. And so, um, I think you, as we develop the conversation a bit more to make sure that there's interoperability, whether it's simple logging in, like app, logging into your Apple ID with your Office 365 credentials, you know, things like that are here and we can leverage them now. And so um, tying into RFP announcements and launches. Yeah, all, I mean, those are things that we take into consideration and really that's under the umbrella of the enterprise yep. uh, that we take those things into consideration. A fourth item that I wanted to mention with our voice services, it's been a conversation that's been ongoing. I'm trying to uh, get us to a point where we don't allow it to drag out too much longer, but it's been one that every time we start thinking we're making progress on how do we move forward with voice service options, voice service and or products for school districts, there's kind of new, yeah. new things that come yeah. into the conversation. Um, so we know we've got a few options about how to kind of provide the uh, direction and availability to, again, voice services and products and services to school districts. Uh, one could be very clearly to eliminate having contracts that, you know, kind of uh, 
all districts are required to use. Uh, while there will still be guidelines and standards that would need to be followed, but to open that up, uh, there's a lot of complexity that comes and, and a lot of uh, responsibility that comes for every district in doing that. They, every district then has to uh, absorb that. Um, one would be to do new contracts under the traditional way we've done them, uh, catch contracts, maybe with some different options than we've had in the past, some more flexibility maybe than what we've had. And then another option is to utilize some existing services that are available through, through existing contracts and right. existing services that we already have in place. And so it seems like every time I feel like we're getting closer to saying, all right, we really feel like this is going to be the best direction, there's some other things that come into the conversation. The other thing we want to do is kind of verify some results that we got back from uh, the survey that we done a couple of months ago with the school districts about, you know, what your preferences are, about whether we do catch contracts or we don't do catch contracts and what that really means. I mean, a simple example of that, and the KEs are going to be working to get this verification, is when we said if we done catch contracts, would you use them, we got a high percentage of districts that said yes. And so that's easy to say yes to that, but what we really need to know is did you really mean that? Do you really want us to have catch contracts that bind you to those contracts and what those requirements are to buy from those particular right. products and services? Um, and again, the KEs are going to work on that. We may have a special webcast on this topic because again, yep. my goal is to really get to the closure fairly soon here. I think we got like three options about how to provide direction and guidance to school districts on voice services and products. All three could probably work and be successful, but we really want to try to make sure that we're working in the best interest of the school districts and what you all want us to do in that area. So that's, that's an area that's ongoing. Um, I want to mention real quickly, uh, Jessica had made a note to me about, evidently there's been some problems with the SHE State Master, the SHI State Master Agreement contract. If you have issues with that, make sure you get that to your KE so that we're made aware of that. So I just wanted to mention that real quick. Um, the Jetronics uh, situation, Pomeroy, uh, you know, was bought by Jetronics. There was issues with Jetronics, and so then there's been issues with Dell ordering. Dell has uh, assumed direct responsibility for uh, taking their orders and, and, and issuing their equipment. Uh, they have identified us. They're going to name a new uh, agent, a new uh, partner that's going to work on their behalf. They haven't done that yet. So we'll share that. I'm sure Dale, I know Dale has been communicating directly with districts as well. Um, so again, it's something we're on top of, you know, but every, I, I would assume that any district and every district that works with Dale uh, has been aware of this and is on top of it. But certainly if you have any questions, direct those to your KE and we'll, we'll certainly uh, follow up with those. Another item I want to mention real quick is the, the tariffs that are uh, in a position to be imposed. Um, you know, we've had this happen in the past, and our partners have been very open with us about how they've been able to absorb these, and when they haven't, and ha when they have been able to, and haven't been able to, and they have clearly pretty stated to us to with new tariffs, they very likely will not be able to completely absorb those without some kind of impact on their pricing. So I don't want to go into a deep conversation about it right now. Uh, it's a it's one of those things you can definitely get into a lot of different sides of the conversation and so forth. But I think it is something for everybody to be aware of, uh, that there are likely some, uh, some, that we will likely observe some impact from the tariffs that are, uh, that are in, in position to be put in place. So I wanted to mention that. I got, I got a couple more things here. I, I'm, I'm trying to stay under my allotted time that David told me I had. <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> All right. Um, real quickly. Uh, this doesn't affect every school district, but uh, districts that have ATCs, we are we are continuing to go on an effort, are on an effort to try to clarify: Are we capturing all of the classroom, the cat, what we would call the catch traditional technology that exists in area technology centers? So those districts that have that, expect that conversation to come to you through your KEs about how can we assure that we're capturing? Because we want to make sure we're including that when we represent K through 12 education technology. We want to make sure that those area technology centers are included. And there's a lot of confusion about what districts are including or not including, um, and and so we're we're working to solve that and make sure that that's that's being covered. Um, one last item I wanted to mention was we are in the process of scheduling our annual uh, vendor partner co uh, meeting. Uh, with, this is a, a meeting we have with all of our cats partners, um, and we're really kind of behind schedule on doing so. There's a variety of reasons to contribute to that. Um, I was hoping as of yesterday that I had a date I could share with you, but we've had a conflict that keeps me from being able to do that. So I do expect that within the next month we will have that meeting. We are going to make it an online meeting. I mean, folks uh, from our vendor partner community will be able to come on site if they choose to, 
but we really are going to encourage it to be a mostly online meeting, an interactive online meeting. It will be done via Skype um, or Teams. I mean, it will be done via one of those mechanisms. Um, and uh, so, again, I expect that to be scheduled within the next month. In the meanwhile, you have topics, questions, things you're going to want to make sure are covered. And I'm speaking to our vendor partner community that watches. Uh, do submit those to Jessica Burton uh, so that we can start building our agenda for that. So you'll see that notice probably within the week. You'll see what the date is. The date will be probably within the next month. Um, and we'll be building that agenda and getting that out to folks ahead of time. Thanks, Mike. Right. Thank you, Doug. Nice. So the last item is, can you put up question five? Because this helps make one of, uh, um, I guess, Linda's points about just a reminder what was the date, Linda? They they need to have that in August fifteenth. August no later than. No, so this is just uh, just a reminder of our annual. Um, have you have you paid that uh, you, the district's portion of Infinite Campus? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Was there anything that bubbled up from Go Soapbox that that uh, we need to address? Yeah, there was. Andy. So some great conversations out there, David, and I think it's probably important. Um, where? Walk a little forward. You can get on camera if you want. If I need to, here we go. Um, you know, typically the public sector, specifically K-12 education is always the envy. Y'all like this? Yeah, exactly. Is always the envy of the private sector and the rest of state government when you look at our education licensing agreements and our ability to access stuff for free. And I'm getting ready to tie a few points together here real quick based okay. on some comments on Go Soapbox. Okay. We really get to take advantage of a lot of free stuff in K-12. You know, when you look at what Microsoft and Google offer, with G Suite for Education and Office 365. Those things are awesome and they provide great functionality to us. However, I think we also need to realize that as we start ratcheting up the conversation about security, to assume that a lot of the free services are gonna offer all of the things you need to address security is probably a good discussion we're gonna have to have at some point in time. Uh, and I equate it to physical security, okay, you know, based on Headlines and cultures and just really horrific events, physical security is something that has become, you know, not only front page information, but it's been a priority for districts to address. When you talk about door access systems, you talk about security cameras, they've had to find a way to address the cost associated with physical security. And when it comes to information security, yeah, there's some free stuff out there built within the systems that can help us mitigate this to some degree, but additionally, there's probably going to be some cost that districts are going to have to assume, and that's a great leadership point to bring to the table, yeah. you know, to have that risk versus reward conversation. So I'm, I'm tying several conversations out there together and just making that point that that's going to be great discussion to prompt the leadership table. So. Yep. And, and David, there are three things I think I'm going to quickly hit from Soapbox. Um, number one, Ket's View. Uh, that is absolutely an internal resource. Uh, if you are off campus and you VPN, back into the KETS network, then you can yeah. get to KETS view as well. Um, number two, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, many of the professional learning uh, sessions, uh, CASEL, the uh, Association for School Librarians events are going on live and also KET offers their media days. That um, is, is a great session for that a lot of people join. And then finally, uh, back on the STLP conversation, just to, just to kind of be clear, in the state of Kentucky with all of our school districts we have four or five weeks that are that our districts have spring break on throughout the course of the year and so when we also take into account the assessment window um, it, we're always going to hit um, a day that schools some of our schools mm -hmm. and districts are off mm -hmm. um, we have had in the past evidence where if the school district was on spring break they've still participated. We know it's not perfect, um, but we also are pretty excited that there's an opportunity from a transportation perspective of not competing with a lot of other events or trying to get back for a bus route, things like that. So again, we're not sure who all is on spring break yet. We know that some large major districts are, um, and, and you know we don't love that, um, but we're hopeful that we still can, can still get that participation going. Well, well, thanks for joining us today. I know we went over our, our goal of, of 11, but to be honest with you, is as we close out, this is our really our last chance. I figured we're going to be able to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, um, I know a lot of you will be closing out the school year and then going, and you don't, you, and we'll, we'll still have our webcast in June and July, but I know, you know, the, the, the history shows, you know, that, that that's cut in half that, during that time. So we really yeah. try to work this in. I do hope you have a good summer break, even though you're not crossed that finish line yet. And for a good number of you, 
Uh, the next time you'll see us is uh, during the next webcast in August, so take care.